And now, broadcasting from deep behind enemy lines in the occupied territory of the Socialist Republic of California, your host, former California State Assemblyman and Governor Candidate, Tim Donnelly. Hey, welcome back to another edition of the Radio Free California Network show, Tim Donnelly show, my show. I am your host, former California State Assemblyman and Radio Governor of California. And wow, you know, it's interesting. Yesterday we said, let's sit tight, feel what we're feeling and, and, and just own it and see what happens. See what comes up, see what comes out instead of just knee jerk jumping to reactions like President Obama. I mean, how embarrassing. It's embarrassing to have a president of the United States who has no sense of the moment. He has no sense that the nation is not looking for another partisan speech, that we would actually like you to bring the country together, reassure people, let people know that you back the Second Amendment, that you back their constitutional rights, that we're not going to erase constitutional rights because of the actions of a single madman of an evil, disturbed soul named Christopher Christopher Harper Mercer, or Chris. And surprise, surprise, we're going to be having Dr. A.W.R. Hawkins on a little bit later in the show. And and, and I I love having this man on because he always has perspective. He's written no less than three articles today covering different aspects, one of which is every single one of the 13 weapons that... Chris Harper or Chris Mercer owned were were legally purchased. He passed a background check because you remember the the media is always saying, well, we got to get rid of the gun show loophole. Whenever they're pressed on that, they don't even know what the gun show loophole is because it doesn't really exist. But they seem to be offended if anyone is able to procure a firearm without the all-important background check. Well, evidently, the all-important background check, it missed this guy who's who's like a red flag of red flags. He, he he's, he's a Grand Canyon. If you were looking for a pothole, you found the Grand Canyon, okay? Uh, the guy's out there on social media. Why is that when they do the background checks? They never check any of that. Uh, look, I'm actually in favor of making it easier for law-abiding citizens to procure firearms. So I'm not asking for them to change policy. Maybe if the background check ain't working, get rid of it. Because as, as you'll hear from Dr. A.W.R. Hawkins in, in his great article up at uh, Breitbart.com, it, it, uh, almost every one of these killers has legally purchased their weapons. So what does that really mean? You you, you want to do more gun control? Is that what you want, uh, Barack Obama? You you want more gun control. Well, the gun control you already pushed for and you already passed, it don't work. I don't know how else. I'm trying to break it down real simple language. It don't work. It ain't working. More of what ain't working ain't a solution. I, I, I don't know. I just figured maybe I say it that way. Maybe he'll hear us. But it's unbelievable, unbelievable what this individual did. Singled out Christians. There are reports that he asked if you were a Christian. If you were a Christian, he shot you in the head. He, he, think about that. You know, in, in in the Bible, it says that there will come a day where you will be tested and you will be given an opportunity to deny me. And those who denied that they were Christians or didn't answer were shot in the leg, but those who admitted they were Christians were shot in the head. Uh, That's a pretty chilling choice that you have to face it's i i can't imagine i 
Uh, out of all of this, rather than emphasize the name of the killer, he's getting plenty of publicity all over the place. We're just going to call him the killer, the mass murderer, the evil one. A hero emerges, a man named Chris Mintz, Air Force, or, uh, let's see if the Air Force or Army, I, Army veteran. Uh, we'll get into that more when we have uh, Dr. A.W.R. Hawkins on and, and flesh out the story. But wow. When you, when you see what people are capable of in moments of duress beyond belief, of the kind of stress and fear and confusion and panic that has set in and taken over almost everyone around him and one individual just decided he was going to refuse to let this killer through the door. So he barricaded the door with his body and nearly paid with his life. And it's, it's, it's such an encouraging story. And, and, and then, of course, then, then I get back to the president. And it's like he openly admits he's politicizing this. And I and I just have a very simple question for him. You keep yapping about more gun control. What kind of gun control other than the full confiscation of every weapon from every individual in uh, on the on the in the United States of America would satisfy you? And by the way, you could never fully confiscate all the weapons from Americans because all you would do is you'd go through your lists of all the registered weapons. And then, of course, when you get to somebody's gun safe, you find out they have 20 other guns that you didn't know because they didn't register them because they were bought them from friends or they were handed down through the family. But people are smart. They keep the unregistered guns buried somewhere or hidden somewhere else. And they have a special safe just for the registered ones. You're, you're never going to get guns out of the hands of Americans. I'm just going to tell you that right now. So anyone who's trying that is a fool. That is a fool's errand. But I think that the president's on to something, though. I think we should join the president in trying to get guns out of the hands of criminals, out of the hands of the people who buy them in back alleys, who buy them at a neighbor's house like Hanoi shared yesterday in rough neighborhoods where nobody ever goes to gun stores. They never abide by the law. They, their, their intent is to commit crimes with these guns. Let's shut down the gun trafficking among criminals. Let's crack down on these illegal operations. While you're at it, maybe if you started cracking down on illegal immigration in the inner cities, you'd find a lot of the Gang members are illegally here. And, and maybe if you use that as a tool to make our community safer, maybe you could commit some, you could prevent some potential murders. You could prevent some future crimes. So I don't know. It's just a crazy idea, but let's target the criminals. Let's punish the criminals. Let's put a task force on the criminals. And everybody else, let's make it easier. Kind of like, Illegal immigration versus legal immigration. We like legal immigration. We don't like illegal immigration. We want to do everything we can to discourage it. Why don't we do the same thing for guns? Have a two-track system. If you're an illegal gun owner, if you want to break the law and flout the law and do all these other things because you're a criminal, okay, we'll throw the book at you. If you're a law-abiding citizen who has complied with the gun laws to the fullest extent you are capable within good faith, we're going to give you grace. And by the way, we're going to make it easier. We're going to stop treating you like you're a criminal. We're going to make it easier for you to get a firearm so you can protect yourself and your family. And maybe you ought to send your kid with one to college. Maybe you ought to get him a CCW and tell him that he shouldn't go to school thinking it's a gun-free zone because at some point he may need it. Just food for thought. And we are just getting started here at the Tim Donnelly Show. Three two three seven. Four six talk. We'll be taking your calls throughout the entire show today. 
So whatever you do, make sure you have that number handy. We'll be right back. Whether you're an experienced shooter or just buying your first gun, Turner's Outdoorsman has everything you need, along with a knowledgeable and friendly staff to help you find that perfect gear for your next adventure. Turner's now has 18 locations across Southern California, including a Victorville location right on Bear Valley Road. Be sure to check out the new Archery Pro Shops in the Victorville, Chino Hills, and Pasadena locations. If you're not sure what you're looking for, you can browse and shop their selection at turners.com. Be sure to check out their weekly specials and sign up to get them delivered directly to your inbox. Turners is where I turn for all my firearms and ammo needs. Remember to tell them Tim Donnelly sent you and you'll get an additional discount. Hey, it's a free-for-all Friday. We will take your calls on pretty much any subject. We are particularly going to focus on the news and information that has come out regarding this latest mass murder. And, and also, of course, the bizarre reactions and coverage by the press, the bizarre reactions by various politicians, and... We'll be taking your calls as well. And coming up in the four o'clock hour, we're going to have a real treat for you with Dr. A.W.R. Hawkins for the first half hour. And then the second half hour, we've got a special guest coming in. And it has nothing to do with politics for once. It is Friday. It's a free for all Friday. I figure we could probably use a break. But I'm not going to tell you who our special guest is going to be yet. You will definitely be very interested in this if you like the movies. That's all I'm going to tell you. And then we're going to move on and dig into more and more of this coverage on, on just what happened. I mean, I, I mean, the part for me, Sean, I don't know about you, but the part that, that, that really struck me when I found out that he targeted Christians, it just gave me a chill. Yes, it's very upsetting. Uh at first, I thought, well, I wonder if this is a, an ISIS kind of a thing, but then it just seems more like it's just, this guy was just evil, angry, satanic, whatever, you know, whatever you want to say. Well, you know, um, religion gets gets a really bad name, and I, I, I have to admit, I, I don't like organized religion, but I love God, okay? I think a lot of people feel that way. This guy evidently expressed that in in a uh, a post he had put up on an internet dating site, but he, he went way beyond not liking organized religion, because you can not like organized religion but love your church or love, especially if your church is not very organized, or is maybe you know more focused on the actual mission of serving the community rather than just raking in money and having a building program, which I think that that tends to bother a lot of people, but. There, there, there was something sinister and, and so cold and methodical about the way he carried out the executions. And, I mean, can, can you picture yourself there? And, yeah, I, it, it's, hard to, it's always hard to know what you would do, but let's go to the phones and see what you would do. Hey, welcome to the show. Hey, Tim. How are you? All right. I want to talk about this tragedy yesterday in Oregon. Let's yeah. flash back to 1966, University of Texas, before the 68 Gun Control Act. Some nut went up to the tower with a high-powered rifle. Right, that's and right. And them off. All citizenry. They pinned him down until law enforcement ran up the tower and shot him dead. Gun-free zones do not work, either. Make everything a gun-free zone or nothing a gun-free zone. Hey, that's you a go good to Beverly point. Hills. You go to Beverly Hills, you walk into a Rolls-Royce dealership, a Louis Vuitton store, they got armed guards. 
You walk in there, you won't even get through the door. They'll shoot you dead. Why are they allowed armed protection? And schools, universities, movie theaters are forbidden. Well, I, here, here, here's, here's, I agree with you, and here, here's my take. Given that these shootings are unlikely to stop because there are a tremendous number of disturbed people in, in the world today, I believe it behooves you to carry your gun everywhere you go if you have a concealed carry permit or if you choose to carry, regardless. Of course. Because you're talking, what, about a misdemeanor? So you, you're going to face a misdemeanor for carrying where you shouldn't carry versus the inability to do something that you're uniquely qualified to do, which is save someone's life or end this killer in his killing spree. Absolutely. If there was armed guards there, maybe he would have thought twice about going there. You see, even a security guard with a gun on his hip, he would have said, if well, I no, oh, no, no. They, hey, they, they had a, they had a discussion. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. The they what? had a discussion about that. Are you aware of that? Oh, yeah. They, they had a discussion. I didn't even know you had your own show until I saw you on Alex Jones. I, I didn't even know. Uh, but but they had a discussion about whether or not to have a security guard, an armed security guard. So they they thought that it might change the culture of the university. It, it, look, I get it. Roseburg is a sleepy little hollow. It, it's a it's a beautiful area. Logging is one of the biggest industries there. And, uh, you know, it just they didn't feel that they had anything to fear. But guns, so they didn't want any guns. But the truth is that most of the people in that region use guns every day as tools out on the farm, out in the forest, you, 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 where you're going to be around wild animals and, and, and what have you. You've got to be prepared. But they're familiar with guns. They understand it. And, and they didn't want to change the culture of academia and make people uncomfortable. Gun-free zone. You know, like uh, when uh, they put out the Batman light, <laughs> that's what a gun-free zone is for a mass murderer because they know nobody's going to stand in their way. Right. No, it's a, it's a target. There was a, a U.S. marshal who came out and said, you are making you, places where you have <laughs> large groups of people, particularly young people, who are, are supposed to be our best and brightest, and you're you're serving them up on a platter. You're saying, "Come and get me." Of course. Yeah, of course. And Oregon knows firsthand because I think two years ago there was a some guy tried to do a mass shooting at a shopping mall, and a CCW holder who didn't know it was a gun free zone was in the shopping mall, and he shot the guy dead. That's right, and it, and, and it was after I believe two and people they tried had to been put him in jail. Two two people had been killed, but but they they were able to they were able to he was able to neutralize the threat, uh, and and it had followed on to a shooting where uh, dozens of people had been killed. That that that's my recollection. But I, I want to ask you a question: the uh, the shooting that happened in 1966, which is interesting to me, that's the year I was born. Um, what w was that? Kent State was that Ohio? No, that was uh, Texas and Austin. Which had okay. a, uh, a rally yesterday trying to ban, <laughs> trying to ban guns there. And what what and is they the know firsthand? Yeah, because the, the the tower had a special uh, name. I forget the. I forget it, the name of the tower. Okay, yeah, but, but it was. Started, it, I mean, he had but it was in, loose, and he started. Yeah, he started shooting people with a high powered rifle, and then the armed citizenry took the rifle down their trucks and started shooting back. Yeah, and, and they, they held him down, down, so he, the he couldn't even the tower. And shot him dead. Yeah. Hey, thank, thanks for the call. Thanks for bringing that up. That was a great comparison to what we need to be thinking about here. 323-746-TALK. We'll be right back with more of your calls.
Hey, if you like shooting as much as I do, you've probably been to a lot of ranges. Unless you've visited Burrow Canyon Shooting Park, you've never seen anything like it. On the way there, you'll find yourself taking pictures as you traverse the majestic Azusa Canyon and wind your way up into the Angeles National Forest. With over 600 acres, including 19 private ranges, there's something for everyone. There's rifle and pistol ranges for beginners, right up to advanced shooters. And there's plenty of spaces to shoot sporting clay. You can make a family day of it, or you can bring a group for team building exercises. Bring a picnic lunch. On the weekends, they provide lunch. And don't worry, they always have ammo in case you forget yours or run out. One thing I can guarantee is that once you visited my friends at Burrow Canyon Shooting Park, you'll be hooked and you'll keep coming back. BurrowCanyon.com is their website or call them at Radio Free California Network. I am Tim Donnelly, your host, former California State Assemblyman and Radio Governor here in California. And if you were listening to the newscast, and uh, both Sean and I were just shocked in sync, uh, you would have heard Hillary Clinton make the most strident remarks about cracking down on gun control. She sounded almost Hitlerian. She was so shrill. Uh, Sean, I don't know if you had a chance to, to pull that. Uh, well, but, let me see. Uh, let's hear it. Let's just see if we can pull it up. I've got the newscast here. Uh, just bear with me here. We'll, we'll find it somewhere here. Let's see. Outage for a few days. Governor Nikki Haley. South. Richard Glossop was. Way to San Juan. Affected by the hurricane. I think it might have been earlier. Nikki Haley, the national. I don't know if it was before the middle break. Or... Jeb Bush says he is opposed. Oh, here it is. If elected president Hillary Clinton. Here we go. Has, has here we go. Authority say the gunman Christopher Ridiculous. Mercer had studied mass shootings. If elected president, Hillary Clinton is promising to take on the gun lobby. What is wrong with us that we can't stand up to the NRA and the gun lobby and the gun manufacturers they represent? The president. Wow. We, the, the, the definition of good in Hillary Clinton's world is we must stand up against manufacturing. That's what I heard. We must stand up against guns, but we'll never stand up against evil. She didn't mention the evil doer. And she, she didn't never, mention and the And she never killer. said she never said anything about the victims either. No, it's like it's like wait a minute. The, 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 this is a culture where it, evil grows in dark places and it feeds on hatred and it feeds on on lies and 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 twisted ideas and the left loves to propagate twisted ideas because they're always blaming the wrong person but they're doing it intentionally and i'm not going to say that the that the right is without their flaws certainly but I would rather be on the side of the NRA and gun owners of California and, and uh, Firearms Policy Coalition standing up and defending, which is a pro completely appropriate, defending the Second Amendment, defending a principled stand on a fundamental natural right that is inculcated in our founding documents. That is what we are standing for. Now, do we have empathy and sympathy for the victims absolutely we are praying for them do we wish somebody had been present who had the capacity and the wherewithal to end this evil yes we we know there was a somebody with the courage to do it and and used every bit of his strength and and very nearly gave his life in the process but he didn't have a gun 
because he, he respected the law. This was a gun-free zone. So by respecting the law, you created a victim pool. You created a, a, a spotlight for, for which the killer was drawn magnetically. And it is Hillary Clinton, it is Barack Obama, and it is people like that that support gun-free zones and want to make it more difficult for people to defend themselves that are going to make it worse in the future, not better. Now, mind you, I'm not blaming them for, for this man's action because I'm not going to play their game. They are not responsible. Barack Obama is not responsible for what Chris Mercer did. Hillary Clinton is not responsible for what Chris Mercer did. Chris Mercer is responsible for what Chris Mercer did. Chris Mercer's parents bear some, will anybody's family, when, when there's a mass murder, bear some responsibility because they knew him better than anybody else. And, and, you, and you heard his neighbors. There was one neighbor who was interviewed and he said, he said, I, uh, you know, they weren't very friendly. They were very cold. And and when the I, I his car got uh, stuck or he needed a jump or something and he he went over to him and he was asking them to move their vehicle and it was late at night and and they were like sure and that was it and he was joking around with them saying look I'm such an idiot I can't believe I did this I'm sorry to bug you in the middle of the night nothing he got nothing well what he's describing is a lack of empathy he's describing a uh, almost a sociopathic state of, 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 of emoting and, and interacting with people. Social retardation. Well, no, it goes a little beyond that. It's more, it's, more, it's more sinister. It's a psychological state where you do not contain the capacity to feel for others. You have no empathy. So then you, if you have no empathy, then you become... Whatever your interactions, they, they become a threat to the other party, in a sense. So when, when, when the Army veteran, uh, Chris Mintz, is finally, you know, shot through both legs, broke his legs, his body's been shot up 15 ways from Sunday, and he falls down, and, and the killer comes through the door, and he says, today's my son's birthday. Well, that doesn't affect him because he shoots him again. See? It, 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 it's almost an invitation because it, it would be like if he saw, let me, let me take it out of the context of shooting and just put it into a different context. If he saw a woman who was in trouble on the side of the road and, and perhaps, you know, wasn't sure what to do. And I'm not saying that, I'm not saying anything about women. I'm just saying he saw somebody, but it happened to be a woman. And so he stops his car. And instead of helping and being a gentleman, and being a good Samaritan, as 99% of the population would, instead of staying with her while they call a tow truck or whatever, he takes her off and, and rapes and kills her. I mean, that's, that's the mentality of someone who is capable of doing what he did. There is no, hey, gosh, this is somebody's daughter. This is somebody's wife. This is, this is somebody, you know, somebody's father who's you know, if I kill him, he's not going to go home to his child because he doesn't feel anything. And 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 that and that right there, you can pass all the damn laws in the world. You ain't curing that. And and none of the background checks picked it up either. Going to go to the phones. We got Mike in Wrightwood. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. You know, if I would have turned this on when you were fast forwarding, I thought my meds were all screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> Whole thing to we did that just but, to mess with your head, Mike. Yeah, but I got it all, though. That's the weird thing. I was I can go back and tell you all the news now in that short period of time. But I do that with a TV, too, and it drives my wife nuts. But, you know, it's I think, um, you know, the definition of gun-free zone is probably the simplest thing in the dictionary. It's target-free because that's all it is. And when you talk about, like, the 1966, the, uh, it's actually called the clock tower. What? And oh, the clock tower. Yeah, people, that's what it was. Right. Yeah, and then one of the persons, uh, the last one victim from that actually died in 2001. So it shows you that when these things happen, they don't end right away. I mean, they, they can have long-term effects, you know, and have multiple, you know, sources of, you know, how you know they're going to affect families and throughout. And then 
you know, I mean, I think I told my wife last night, it's like, you know, it's, I stayed away from the TV because I didn't want to, you know, listen to this stuff. I didn't want to hear about what was going to come because I knew that it was only going to be a matter of seconds, you know, before I had to see Obama on the TV using this. I mean, when it's black on black crimes, you don't see a lot from him. When it's black on white, it's racism. We have an issue. And when it's a white on everybody, then it's gun free time. So, I mean, he's got a pretty specific agenda on what he's doing, you know, and how he's trying to divide us and how he looks. And, I mean, Hillary showed her true colors today, though. She's 100% against handing guns out, just like in Benghazi, when she didn't want to make sure people had the guns and the ammo and what they needed out there. So they died. So she's already seen firsthand not arming people the right way. And, you know, when it comes to, like, a security guard, the only worry I ever have about something where that's your only minor defense is that somebody that's going to walk in might be, you know, able to take that guy out first and from there it could get worse. But if we're all walking around with weapons and, you know, like we do, you know, are used to up in New Mexico, Texas, and other states, people are a little more scared about walking into facilities and doing these kind of things. Because well, yeah, they, they, they also treat each that. other with a little more respect. Right. And it's, uh, you know, I, I've actually been to Walmart and had guys walking in, you know, and they have them underneath their arm or on their hips. And, you know, so it's, you know, we don't have a lot of that stuff out there. But, you know, anyways, you know, I actually, you know, I figured, you know, to do something positive. I just wanted to, you know, send some stuff out real quick if I can. You know, there's um a lot of vets when I run into them at the VA, they don't know a lot of things that are out there. And, you know, I encourage all the guys that are out there. You know, there's adaptive sports for all you guys that are Vietnam, Korea, whatever. You know, get involved with adaptive sports. I, what are know, adaptive sports? There's nothing. Adaptive sports is uh, for guys with disabilities where they can actually take them up to, like, Mammoth. And if they're in a wheelchair, they'll put them actually in a chair and ski them down the uh, slopes holding on to them. And, oh, you know, nice. And, and adapt- That's awesome. Oh, it's it's incredible. I mean, I just did the Four Quarters Extreme where they put Vietnam vets and stuff inside these uh, four-wheelers and one of those mountains and stuff. And, you know, when you sit there and watch Vietnam guys and have tears coming down their eyes because – they're getting what we get. It's incredible. And a lot of them, you know, a lot of people don't know what stuff is out there, but, you know, if you got a father, grandfather, whatever that's, you know, that was in the military, served Korea, Vietnam War II, you know, they're probably, you know, you know, some of them probably don't really know a whole lot about the computer. Do it for them. You know, look up adaptive sports, look up the World of War Project, you know, for some, for those that were in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And I know that, you know, sometime within the next year, we're actually going to plan a walk from California to, I believe it's somewhere back east, and I think it's Alabama or Atlanta. And we're going to walk out that way until we were a project decides to let Vietnam vets inside, you know, so that way we're not leaving anybody behind. But there's organizations and things out there for you guys. There's organizations that can help you with your VA benefits. And, you know, when I ran into a guy yesterday, it kind of hit me that, you know, this guy, you know, they do couples retreats where they'll bring you and your wife, you know, to Lake Tahoe or somewhere really nice where you spend four or five days and they discuss the issues of war and combat and the effects it has on a family. You know, and then there's wow. other ones like adaptive sports where you just go out and have a good time and get out there. Just don't sit there and wait for life to just go by. Start seeing you can enjoy it. And when you go to adaptive sports and they take you to like Mammoth, you get a lifetime pass. You get to go up there and they'll hook you up. Uh, hey, hey Mike, and... we, we, we've got to take a break, but I would love to have you connect me with a couple of resources. Maybe I could even interview somebody who is doing one of these programs as well and maybe have both of you, you and him on. Because um, I do think this is really, really critically important. But thanks. Thanks for bringing this up and, and, and for encouraging people, because you're right. We, we need to we need to have some positive news. And uh, but but we do need to take a break right now. So I'm going to let you go. But but. Uh, yeah. Email me some info on that. Thank you. Hey, and by the way, we are going to have special guests coming up at the 435 hour. I'm still not going to tell you who it is. But think Hollywood. Think movies. Hey, if you like what you've been hearing on The Tim Donnelly Show, then support it. 
If you own a business, we have a tremendous audience, not only on air, but also online. And we've got a great social media presence. And you can participate in all of that by simply picking up the phone and calling 760-244-4444. That's the office line to Bethany, who can schedule you to come in and record your own commercial, or you can send us a script and I'll read it. Whatever you do, you got to act now because your future customers are my loyal listeners. It's a free-for-all Friday here. We've got an action-packed 4 o'clock hour coming up with Dr. A.W.R. Hawkins, who is, you know, interestingly, not only is he an expert on guns and gun law, but he's a, he, he, he is a philosopher. When we hear him talk, he is... He philosophizes about liberty and the role of government in a way I've never heard anyone else so eloquent, so passionate. And he always gets to the heart of the BS, the, that, the BS narrative that the media and the left is pushing. And in this case, of course, they go immediately. They don't even let the, they don't even let the bodies of the victims be buried before they're pontificating and politicizing this horrific tragedy. Here you have a sleepy little Oregon town. And I I was just up there. I just drove through Roseburg. I don't think we stopped. We were in a hurry trying to get to dinner with with a friend of mine. I was was driving my son up to Seattle a couple weeks ago. And I I love Roseburg. It's it's just a cool little town. It's sort of the quintessential small town with the logging and and, and activities going on that, that might have gone on 50 or 100 years ago. But a modern-day pathology caught up with them yesterday, as you know, and 10 human beings lost their lives, ranging in age from like 18 to 67. It was, it's hard to be careful with the words you use because you need to use such extreme words to describe such evil. But I, but I don't want to. I don't want to be gratuitous about it, and I don't want to. I don't want to give this man any. Any. I don't want to give him what he wanted, which is he wants his name to be in lights. But see, for me, he's just the killer. Uh, I, I did note. I, I was reading coverage today, and I, and I noticed there were actually a couple of fair-minded articles. And the article simply said he had X number of, of I think it was three pistols and one rifle, right? That, that's it. That, that's factual, right? So you, you take that fact and you say, oh, okay, that's what he had. And then I read the left-wing LA Times. And this is how they describe it. Armed with three handguns and an assault rifle. Well, <laughs> he stormed the college Snyder Hall at 10.30 a.m. It, it, the language is always derogatory, pejorative. And, and, and for those of you who are thinking about voting for Hillary Clinton or Jeb Bush or both, the pejorative simply means language that is slanted and biased in, in pushing you to a certain conclusion, essentially. Uh, and, and, and it's very aggressive language in that regard. And it, it's largely unnecessary. Because every weapon is designed to assault. But when they say assault weapon, they've created a category of guns that, you're, that it's okay to hate. It's okay to be prejudiced against certain types of guns, right? They're, I guess the assault weapon is kind of like the, the white Christian, the white Southern Christian, you know, where basically this is the one category of human being that you're allowed to demonize and stereotype and vilify. So the assault weapon is that. And you, you, you can, anytime there's any kind of a, of an issue and a gun is involved, we all know what's going to happen. The very first thing the media is going to do is blame the gun. So the killer becomes a gunman. 
The murderer becomes a shooter or an active shooter. The, the perpetuator of evil, the evildoer, is left behind. And we start talking about what to do about guns in the hands of non-evildoers. Do you, see the, do you see the jump? Do you see the leap? It's just straight up Alinsky. Never let a crisis go to waste. And Obama didn't. He didn't waste any time. And, and you know, he wasn't particularly compelling. He, he sort of leaned on the podium and just jawed like, like he would be talking to a neighbor, not as if he were the president of the United States with all of the majesty and pomp and circumstance and respect due that office. He couldn't muster any of that. He must have just come off the golf course and they forced him to change into a suit and tie and he was probably pissed off. But I, I still want to know. I want to know a simple answer to a simple question. And that is, what, what gun control? What's it going to do? Tell me that. You want more gun control, Obama? What exactly do you want? Do you want to just get rid of guns altogether? Do you want to be honest about that finally? Because I think that's what you want to do. By the way, we've got Dr. A.W.R. Hawkins coming up right after this upcoming break. You do not want to miss him. He's written several articles. We're going to get into some real details about what happened yesterday that were not available in the media until late, late in the day. And I want to get your reaction as well. We'll be taking your calls throughout the show. 323-746-TALK. 323-746-TALK. That is our number. And we will be right back in a short little while after this break. Radio Free California Network. I am your host, Tim Donnelly, former California State Assemblyman and Radio Governor, California. And by the way, we stream live every day, 3 to 6, at timdonnellyshow.com. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, email, and the good old-fashioned telephonic device invented by Alexander Graham Bell that you are texting on right now. And we're going to go to the Radio Free California Newsmaker lines and bring on regular guest and Breitbart columnist and just philosophical and liberty genius extraordinaire, Dr. A.W.R. Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you, Tim. Great to be with you. Yeah, you're a very popular guest here, by the way. Every time you're on, people, oh, you. people want to hear more of you. And when I saw you had multiple articles written about what happened yesterday, and I, I love your research. The first one I wanted to start with, if you don't mind, is the gun was legally purchased. Right. And, and you okay. brought up the point that in almost every one of these shootings, they're legally purchased. Right. Well, I've said before, Tim, and I might have said it with you, but I'll say it now in case I haven't. It's harder to find a public attacker in the last 15 years who didn't pass a background check than it is to find one who, who did pass one. Uh, they all go through background checks. Background checks do not stop latent criminals. They only stop actual criminals. They don't stop potential criminals, only actual criminals. So people who have a desire to kill people if they've never killed them before, they can go buy any gun they want. And that is the lie that exists behind background checks. Background checks will never keep dangerous people from getting guns. It's the bottom line. Yeah, and I mean, you went through the list. I'm, I'm pulling it up here so that I can read it because it, 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 it's really... It's profound. Yeah, yeah, because I... I just give me a second here because I, I, I want to read it because I think it makes a really powerful impact 
when you hear that the the actual and and while while you're pulling it up, let me point out that the left loves to seize on the Aurora theater shooting, and they love to seize on the D.C. Navy Yard shooting. Both gunmen in those examples pass the background check. You will read that when you read what you're getting ready to read. But yeah, it's just important for people to listen for it. I mean, it's the left has sold us a lie on this. They have, and and so here is the list. It is an extensive paragraph. Other, uh, th- this is from uh, an article at Breitbart.com by Dr. A.W.R. Hawkins. And I-, I just advise you to subscribe to his stuff and make sure you always read it because you will learn more in the few. You're a true guy because you use the fewest words possible, and it's awesome. Other attackers and alleged attackers who have passed background checks for their guns. Vester Lee Flanagan. That's uh, in, out of Virginia, isn't he the the one that is? Right. Is he the he one that did people the, on air on August twenty sixth? Right. He 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 killed him where? On air. Oh, uh, that's right. The the live on air. The reporter. August twenty sixth. Right. Yep. John Russell Hauser of Lafayette, Muhammad Yusef Abdulaziz, the Chattanooga killer, the one who went on and, and killed the uh, recruiters. Dylan Roof, the one who went in the church and killed nine black Americans, black churchgoers. Elton Simpson, Nadir Sufi out of Garland. Jared and Amanda Miller, Las Vegas. Elliot Rogers, the Santa Barbara killer, right here in California. As a matter of fact, they passed new laws. You, You know they passed new laws with his name on it. Out here right. in California right. to to right. n- now now you, if you suspect your neighbor might not like you or if you don't like your neighbor and you want to get them back for something, you can actually get their guns taken away without a, without a hearing. They'll hold a secret grand right. jury. But They'll now, go in, snatch important. their guns and and keep them for 21 days. Tim, Tim, you've raised an important point. I just want to make this real quick because I had a piece this week. That, that where I argued that background checks are gun controls, Trojan horse. This is a perfect example of that. California has universal background checks. They have those. Elliot Roger went through them. It didn't stop him. So what do they do? They want to pass more, more gun control. See, because background checks open the door, and then they can keep the expansion up. It's a lesson to the rest of the country. Once once you give in and pass expanded background checks, which will never stop public attackers, never. Once you do that, you've opened the door to every type of gun control imaginable. California is case in point. Exactly. And by the way, Elliot Rogers' parents were pretty much the only people who knew what a psychopath he was. And, and right. their solution was to send him to Santa Barbara and maybe the surf and sun would heal him. <laughs> I mean... Hollywood's the one screaming for gun control, and yet what they really needed was to be good parents and maybe to commit their son into an institution right. or, or do something in some capacity. But uh, Ivan Lopez, the Fort Hood shooter, Darian Marcus Aguilar, Marilyn Mall, uh, Carl Halvison Pearson, who went into Arapaho High School and committed his mayhem, Paul Ciancia, the LAX shooter, I think he shot some TSA agents. Andrew John Engegeiter out of Minneapolis. Aaron Alexis, the D.C. Navy yard shooter. Tennis Melvin Maynard, West Virginia. Wade Michael Page shot up a Sikh temple. Yeah, that was a really evil thing that happened here in California. James Holmes, the Aurora Theater. There you have it. Jared Lautner of Tucson. Nadel Hassan. Oh, that was the real Fort Hood shooting. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... Uh, the Fort Hood shooting in 2009, because there were two. There was one earlier right. in 2014. But but uh, uh, then Jiverly Wong, Bingham, and then Sung Hyu Cho. That was the Virginia Tech shooting where 33 students were murdered. The, the worst college right. shooting in, in the gun country. Free, in a gun-free zone. In a gun-free zone, and he legally purchased his gun. So what What up, Obama? What What gun control are you pushing for? Navid Hawk out of well, Seattle. Well, and then the... Go ahead. What Obama's pushing for, just in case your listeners didn't hear it, 
he's not he's not just pushing for background checks. He is pushing for confiscation full on. He shifted yesterday to an Australian type confiscation. He was not shy about it. And the, here's the deal. Every law that they have put in place to this point has failed. And instead of recognizing the failure of those laws, and, and Tim, your audience is astute enough to understand this. Instead of understanding how unnatural it is to demand that people be unarmed, instead of understanding that, Obama wants to just step over all of that failure and say, look, none of this worked. Let's confiscate all guns. That is our president, President Barack Obama. It's just chilling even just listening to you say it. I know it's true, but it's just uh, the last killer on the list. Just to finish out your list is Mark Barton, Atlanta shooter. Look, almost every one of them, as you said, it's harder to find a killer who did not pass the background check than one who did in, in these mass shootings in, in recent uh, memory here. And, and yet this is simply being used in full Alinsky style, to deprive Americans of a fundamental natural right to defend their own lives and their own freedom. And we know it. And, and the bottom line is that, that we have got to make certain that people understand what's really at stake and not allow this to be railroaded through. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk about some glimmer of hope out of this shooting, we've got Dr. A.W.R. Hawkins on the line, and we will be right back after this break. talking with Dr. A.W.R. Hawkins about the Oregon shooting at Umpqua Community College yesterday. And Dr. Hawkins, you wrote a couple of articles. One you pointed out, which we just discussed, the that almost every mass shooting has been committed by someone who passed a background check. So those are not very effective. So all these calls for more gun control are really calls for more control. And they've, they've shifted, as you identified. Obama has shifted. He now wants confiscation. And and yet there's another story that has emerged, a hero who stood up to this evildoer, this murderer, and he miraculously survived. I mean, t- tell us about it. Right. Right. Yeah, I think you're talking about Chris Mancy. Uh... He went, he charged the door when he saw the shooter was trying to come through. He tried to hold the door closed. I think, I think he was shot three times through the door. He may have been shot five times through the door. And I only say that because there are conflicting reports. Either way, shot a number of times through the door. Then the gunman came through the door. And when he did and he saw Mintz on the floor, Mintz looked up at him to explain his actions and said, it's my son's birthday today. Uh, what a remarkable story. And uh, Mintz is a 10-year Army veteran, a former cage fighter, and he should be honored by every American who is within earshot of what we're talking about right now. And he, he survived, right? Right. He did survive. And not only did he survive, not only did he survive to him, but today on Facebook he had one of his friends post a message that he was keeping the other wounded in mind, and he wanted them to know that. So the focus, classic military pers- military mentality, the focus isn't even on him. After all these wounds and the fact that he is going to have to relearn how to walk, that's how damaged his legs were. Wow. Regardless of that, he made sure that everyone knows, look, my focus is on you folks. I'm thinking about you. I mean, that, 
his his act of courage. I mean, you got to understand, he was shot through both legs, broke both legs. That uh, think about that. You had to be shot multiple times in the legs to to br literally break your legs, and right. and and yet he held him off through that door for quite some time, and slowed down the rate of killing. Which to me, that's the definition of a hero. That's somebody who he he. You know, it, it is funny when I was reading your article, and for some reason I'm I'm having trouble pulling it back up. Um, but he, you you made a typo. I, I know you, you're like, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for telling me that on air. But I think it was a Freudian slip. Because his name is Chris Mintz. You called him Christ Mintz. And, oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. That, was a, that was a slip. I didn't aim to do that. No, I know you didn't. But, but really, when someone lays down their life for a friend or lays down their life for a stranger, I mean, that, that is answering the call of Christ who, who right. did that for all of us, and right. uh, it just, it, it, you know, I, I get, I get, I think we all get tired of only talking about negative stories, but I, I certainly thought that was worthy to note that you had someone who literally, can you imagine if he'd actually had a gun, if he'd been armed on campus right. and been allowed to? Right. Because, well, then that's the piece I wrote last night. What if he had been armed the way, you know, there was an attack on November 20th on the Florida State campus. There was a concealed carry permit holder who had a clear shot at the shooter, could have taken him out. This concealed carry permit holder was not only a permit holder, but a combat veteran, combat veteran. And he couldn't have a gun with him because of the laws that Florida has in place, barring law-abiding citizens from carrying guns for self-defense. It's ridiculous. Florida should be ashamed. The people who pass laws barring them from carrying guns should be ashamed. And the people, I'll say it, the people at the college in Oregon, I know they feel that shame right now. Part of being an American, part of being alive, is defending our life when need be. And when you take that ability away, you make people setting ducks. And that's what we saw in in uh, Roseburg, Oregon. I hope we don't see it again anytime soon, but that's what we saw there. Well, and and you you just stated it. It was the law that deprived people of their rights that made them victims. And it it is the law that put them in danger. The law requiring right. that this college, this university be a gun-free zone. And I I'm I'm actually going to suggest, and I'm not going to apologize for it, that people civilly disobey these dangerous laws and carry your gun on campus. And, and then when you're able to save lives because you had the forethought, let's let's see let's see them tear you apart then because we'll have your back. Right. Well in a town like Throsburg, there's not gonna be a lot of there's not gonna be a lot of afterward protests and fights. Roseburg is a hunting and fishing town. It is a town that is strong on the Second Amendment. The community college is an exception in that town rather than the norm. And so, you know, you're right. If someone there had been if someone there had been armed and had shot Mercer before he could kill others, that person would have been praised, not punished. Yeah, exactly. And and uh caller brought up at the very beginning of the show that there was a um, uh, a, a shooting in 1966. At, I believe it was on uh, Texas, uh, on, a, on a university campus right. in, in Austin, Texas. University of Texas from the tower. That's right. UT from the clock tower, and and it was ordinary citizens. Of course, <laughs> the, everybody's armed in Texas, right? It, I don't think you're allowed to be right. in the state and not be armed. But they were They're using their taxes, hunting right. rifles, which were just part of their everyday uh, toolkit, basically. To to keep this this murderer who was sniping people with a with a an actual sniper rifle um, from the clock tower, and they were able to keep him at bay until the cops could get up there and and uh, and take him out. And see, fast forward to 2015, Tim. 2015, campus carry is going to be illegal in Texas, and University of Texas 
the students are pulling together to oppose it and to pressure uh, the, uh, the administration at the school to opt out of campus carry because they say campus carry isn't safe for students. That's how much things have changed in the decades we're discussing. Wait a minute. I, the students don't want the ability to carry on campus? Right. Well, I shouldn't say the students. It's the student government. And anyone who goes to a large university understands what a student government is comprised of. It's comprised of the liberals who have connections who get elected to the office. And that's what's happening at the University of Texas. And so the student government has said, you can look it up, look up AWR Hawkins, put a plus on Google and add this quote that they are opposed to campus carry for public safety, for the oh, reason of public safety. And think about how backward that is. In other words, what they're saying is if we're unarmed, we're safe. That's what they're saying. Yeah, and we've had Susanna Hupp on this show who was in the Luby Cafe when she had left her gun in the car out of compliance with the law instead of taking it in her purse inside the restaurant while she had lunch with her parents. And that was the last time she ever saw her parents alive again because the killer right. killed her parents. Her dad tried to, to uh, you know, charge the killer and was, and was gunned down. And she was right. unable to pull and her she gun. she held her hands on his chest and tried to, uh, a, a form of compression to try to stop the bleeding. And you think about that here, the visual to me, Tim, is this. You have a woman who is pressing on, on the ruptured veins and arteries in her dad's chest to keep the bleeding from progressing. When what she could have been doing with that same hand is holding that 38 special in her hand and taking that killer out before her dad was ever shot. That's right. And that is a lesson right. that is not lost on Governor Greg Abbott, one of the greatest men that ever walked this earth. Well, you guys are blessed to have a great governor there. Dr. A.W. Hawkins, thanks for coming on the show today. Keep writing those great articles. Oh, Tim, always great to be with you. Thank you. We're going to be right back with stunt legend Jack Gill. You won't want to miss it. A change of pace, and boy, do we sure have one. On the line with us, about to join us, is legendary stunt coordinator Jack Gill. You may not know his name, but you definitely know his work because he has directed, been second unit and stunt coordinator on blockbuster movies such as Fast and, or I'm sorry, Furious Seven, Right Along, Right Along Two, Fast Five, The Hangover Part Three. Date Night, Wild Hogs, Austin Powers in Gold Member, Showtime, Money Train. And he also, as a younger man, did actual stunt work where he was a stuntman on Knight Rider and Dukes of Hazard. His father is a or was a two star general who served this country honorably. And Jack Gill, his last little tidbit. Members of the Tim Donnelly Show audience know actress Morgan Brittany very well. They know her writing. They know her opinions. She's co-hosted. Well, he is lucky enough to be married to her, and they have two children. Uh, Jack, welcome to the show. <laughs> great to join you. That's a, a pretty long intro. I didn't realize all that had really happened to me, but it's great to hear it after <laughs> this long. <laughs> well, you know, you asked. I, I asked for a mini bio, and I and and it was very. Uh, uh, it's amazing what you've done. And, you know, I thought that you had gotten into this industry by your father because as I was Googling you, there were all these different names. Turns out you pioneered for your family, basically went out there in a complete unknown territory and uh, and wound up working in Hollywood. I mean, so many people dream of that and so few ever, ever do it. Well, that, that's the really hard part of it all for everybody that tries it is when you first say you're going to do it, it's easy to say it. But, you know, the minute you step outside of that comfort of your home and leave for California, 
you, everybody has doubts about it. You just have to keep working at it as hard as you can. And, and, you know, my family was totally behind me. And my father originally had wanted me to join the military. But at the time, I was racing motocross, motorcycles professionally and making a good living at it. And I just didn't really want to give all that up to get into the military. And I had told him, look, if my career, you know, falters here, I'll definitely think about joining the military. And then from this motorcycle racing came this chance to be a stud man, and he jumped on board with it and said, you know, it sounds like that's really what you want to do, and, you know, go follow your dream. And if you don't make it, you can always come back here and go figure something else out. So wow. having wow. your family behind you is a big part of it. Hey, te- so tell us how that first break came for you. Well, it was odd. I was, I was racing in Florida, and I had won a couple of races, and I happened to be in the same hotel that Hal Needham, a very famous stuntman and, and director, um, was staying and he was doing a movie called Gator back then and he saw me and we started talking and as we started talking he said it sounds like you're a pretty good you know motorcycle guy and I said I am and he said do you think you can jump a motorcycle over six burning cars and I said well if I can build a ramp I can jump over it. and he said okay fine you know get your butt out to California and we'll see what you can do <laughs> and so that was the first chance I got at it at the time I didn't really know what to expect but the the best thing he did for me was once he gave me that first job, he said, you can't use my name and throw it around. You can't do anything and try and get better jobs because of me, but I'll be a guy that you can call for advice. And, but said, don't start throwing my name around. And if it looks like you make it in the business and you're doing pretty well, I'll contact you and we'll start working again. And about two years into my career, I had been doing Dukes of Hazard for a pretty long time. And he called me up and said, I heard you're doing pretty well. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm working consistently and I'm happy. And he said, all right, come work with me on the Cannonball films. And we did both Cannonball runs and then we did Hooper. I mean, we did a bunch of films together. And at that time, well, I think that was the best advice he could have given me is not to really help me out, but just give me fatherly advice. Hey, that, that's really interesting because I think a lot of people assume that as soon as you have a connection and you name drop that uh, that's the magic. And, and, and the reality is that Hollywood is like any other business, right? All that matters in the end, obviously connections help, but is results. It, it does. And the, the big part of this is Hal Needham's name was so iconic in the business that he knew if I started throwing it around, I would get in the business pretty easily. And I wouldn't have to really work for it. And he wanted me to work for it. Well, so I, I want you to, I want you to tell me it, about the first stunt, though. What happened? You had to build a ramp, jump over six burning cars. That had to be scary. I mean, how did it go? Well, I mean, uh, since I had been a motocross, a professional motocross racer, the jumping part of it was the easy part. It was finding the right motorcycle, setting up the ramp the proper way. You know, once I had gotten out there, this was a little bitty low-budget film that um, that he was just doing on the side. And he kind of just gave it to me and said, have at it, it's all yours. And so I got complete control of it and got to be able to build a ramp that I wanted. And I tested the jumps without the burning cars there first to make sure that I could make it. And then I just lined them all up knowing that I could make the jump and the fire. I knew I was going to go through it pretty quickly anyway. So that really wasn't an issue, but you know, coming in blind like that and not really knowing much about the business, that was a a pretty rough way to start, you know, as my first stunt. Okay. So I, I just want to picture this. Because I, I always loved watching Evil Knievel and, and all those kind of stunts. I'm sure everybody did. So when you're testing it, first time, you've never done this. You, you don't have the experience of, hey, I know if I launch here at this angle, at this speed, I'm then going to land here. Because you don't you set up like a landing ramp? Uh, no. We, they wanted me to go to the ground. They wanted me to jump over the cars and go to the ground. So oh, okay. sometimes you so, set up a landing ramp when, when you're on a really heavy motorcycle. Like a Harley, like what Evil used to jump, yeah, you definitely have to have a landing ramp. Um, but back then, this was 1977, 78, um, you know, most of the motorcycles were built with enough suspension that you could jump them, you know, 10 to 12 feet high in the air and still, you know, land on the other side without losing it. So I started, I started slow. I built a ramp and got to where I knew I could jump two cars, and then I said, okay, here's the distance for three cars. And I did that way before I put any cars in. I just measured them all out. And just kept jumping it, you know, one afternoon until I got it right. And I blew out the front spokes in my front wheel on one of the jumps and had to replace them. And, you know, there were lots of other issues that came about. But 
you know, if you're given the time to rehearse it, you can kind of figure it all out. Um, luckily, I didn't crash on any of them, and it all worked out great. But it was just a, it was a kind of a throw me into the frying pan as my first big stunt. And I mean, you've been working, you've been working all over the place. And then most recently, I was just watching a YouTube video of you. By the way, we've got your bio and this YouTube and, and your website and everything up at timdonnellyshow.com. If you're just tuning in, we're talking to legendary stunt coordinator Jack Gill, who also happens to be married to uh, a favorite of this show, uh, actress Morgan Brittany. You're. You <laughs> You're a lucky man. Your your wife is not only beautiful, but she is incredibly intelligent and one of the best writers that I've ever interviewed. And uh, oh, thank you, you. Yeah, yeah. You are you are you're I, definitely I am a, incredibly lucky. You you are a one blessed of those man. Types of things that when we oh thanks, Tim. It was it was strange. We met on Dukes of Hazard, and she had really never done a Dukes of Hazard. I'd been on the show about two and a half years, and usually on Dukes of Hazard we don't get to see the actors but one day a week because we were out doing all the action sequences apart from the actors and then we come in one day a week and kind of dial the actors into what we did so this one day they told me hey jump on to where the actors are and set up this little fight scene and then come back and join us so you can drive the car later so i ran into warner brothers and started to do this little fight scene and i met morgan and that same day I asked her to marry me. Now, I was joking at the time, but wow. we got married about four months later. So it happened pretty quickly. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down here. <laughs> so you, you saw her. Did you ask her out for a date first before you asked her to marry you? Well, it didn't go really that well to start with because when I first walked up to her, she was on the soundstage putting her makeup on at the makeup table, and I came by and said, hey, uh, I don't know that if you've worked with this director before, but he really doesn't like the actors to put a whole lot of makeup on, so you should probably take like half of that off. And she went, excuse me? I mean, who are you? Are you the makeup artist? And I went, no, no, I'm just one of the stunt guys, but I'm just telling you I've worked with this director before, and you may want to take some of your makeup off. So that probably wasn't the best line ever to start with, but after about you know 10 or 12 minutes, we started talking about different things, and then as the day went on, I, we started talking about, well, maybe let's go out together. And as we started to talk about going out the first weekend, she said she couldn't do it because she had a commercial to do in San Francisco. And she said, but what about next weekend? And I said, I can't. I'm going up to Canada to do this movie. And I said, look, you know, it's so far away now. Why don't we just get married and forget all the dating process? And she said, maybe that's easier. And we <laughs> laughed. And we ended up getting married four months later. So. Now, that, uh, that's amazing because I, I, there's probably some – Young people out there, you know, young men thinking about what kind of line to use. So first, because most women might see that as an insult. I mean, just say. Yeah, I know. It, and uh, I but, was trying hey. to help. <laughs> That's great. Hey, we're, we're going to take a, a, a quick break. We're, we're talking with legendary stunt coordinator Jack Gill, and we will continue right after this break, including talking about his work on Furious 7. Whether you're an experienced shooter or just buying your first gun, Turner's Outdoorsman has everything you need, along with a knowledgeable and friendly staff to help you find that perfect gear for your next adventure. Turner's now has 18 locations across Southern California, including a Victorville location right on Bear Valley Road. Be sure to check out the new Archery Pro Shops in the Victorville, Chino Hills, and Pasadena locations. If you're not sure what you're looking for, you can browse and shop their selection at turners.com. Be sure to check out their weekly specials and sign up to get them delivered directly to your inbox. Turners is where I turn for all my firearms and ammo needs. Remember to tell them Tim Donnelly sent you and you'll get an additional discount.
Hey, you are tuned to the Radio Free California Network. I am your host, Tim Donnelly, former California State Assemblyman and Radio Governor of California. And we have on the Radio Free California Newsmaker line with us, special treat on a Friday when we try to get away from politics, take a little vacation. We've got legendary stunt coordinator, Jack Gill, who is also married to actress Morgan Brittany, who you do know. But now you're going to know Jack's work if you didn't know who was the legend behind a lot of these scenes. Jack, a lot has changed in, in stunts and in stunt coordinating and, and, and this whole industry. And you worked on the Furious 7 movie which has just come out as to massive blockbuster success, uh, obviously in part uh, due to um, the publicity that, that came uh, due to the tragic death of Paul Walker. Um, some of the, I mean, if you want, just, just tell us what it was like to work on that. Cause that had, had to be um, one of the hardest things you would have had to do. Well, I mean, it was, it was, Definitely tough because we had done so many pictures with Paul Walker before that. Um, I came in on Fast and Furious 5. And so, you know, you're talking about four or five years of being, you know, day in and day out with all of the actors. And Paul was one of the guys that was, you know, an easygoing, the nicest guy in the world, you know, had no airs about him. And he always, always wanted to help. And the odd thing about it, which was, so tragic is that on the airplane ride to start Fast and Furious 7, Paul had said that he was going to take a break after this movie and just be a farmer for a while. He said, I just want to see, you know, what it's like to just be a normal human being for a while and just get out of the movie business for four or five years. And, and I just want to take a break and hang out with my daughter. And I thought that's a fantastic thing for him to do just to get away from it all. And then to have that happen halfway through the movie was just horrible. Wow. Wow. Yeah, he seemed like such a, a, a just a decent guy, really nice human being. Um, I happened to be with uh, Lou Ferrigno and his wife, Carla, when when the news broke. We were at dinner with them and it was just, I mean, so devastating because th they were friends. I wasn't a personal friend of his. You know, I could just see his persona from afar. But I mean, was he really like the the way that he comes across? I mean, yes. I mean, to give you a perfect example, is on the airplane riding out there from L.A. to Atlanta, where we shot Furious 7, Paul was sitting across the aisle from me, and next to him was an elderly woman, and they were talking. And as Paul and I were talking, she heard us talking about the, the movie, and she turned when we started talking and said, so, honey, are, are you in the movie business? And he said, yes, ma'am, I am. And she goes, oh, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm an actor. And she said, oh, well, what movies have you done? And he named off a flurry of films. And she said, well, I'm sorry, I haven't seen any of those. He goes, ah, you know, don't worry about it. That's, you know, a lot of these films, most people haven't seen anyway. And they started talking about his farm and they went on and talked <laughs> about his farm and his tractor and all of his plants for another 45 minutes to an hour. And at the end of the trip, when we got off the airplane, she stood up and she said, you know, honey, I hope your acting career does well because you sure are a nice guy. And he said, well, thank you, ma'am. I really appreciate it. And we walked off. And there was no arrogance to it and none of that. You don't know who I am bit or anything. It was just two people talking about normal things. And that's kind wow. of the guy he was. Wow. That that's incredible. I, I was looking, talking about the movie here. I was looking at that. Uh, I haven't seen the movie, but I've, I was watching your trailer that you sent me. Holy moly. Cause I live in the mountains. You guys have cars tearing through trees. And I noticed because you've got like a GoPro camera, and, and by the way, if you're just tuning in, you can check this out. The, the, vi the video link is up at timdonnellyshow.com. But, but you, see, you see, like, you guys put these rails on there. I never noticed any of that. You, uh, we in the public think they just go careening through, uh, you know, flying through the air. But you've sort of got it controlled. Right. Yeah, I mean, each and every stunt is thought out way ahead of time. And we even rehearse a lot of this stuff because, you know, they are so dangerous. But, you know, nobody really knows how many different cuts it takes you know, to make a sequence up. And, and when you're dealing with the action world, a lot of these cars, you can't put a human being in them for some of the wrecks that we do. So we have to put the car either by remote control or on a rail when we're doing these really huge crashes because no human being could really survive, survive these kind of crashes. But on Furious 7, we're always trying to push the envelope with each Fast and Furious film. 
And the good part about the franchise is that the studio is behind us 100%. So we do get the time to rehearse these things way ahead of time. And so by the time we're out there in the field shooting them, we've all got it all worked out and everybody's seen it as a rehearsal and knows what to expect. But it's still very dangerous and we still, you know, have to worry about safety on the set all the time. But like I said, the rehearsal part of it is the thing that really makes it work for all of us. Hey, hey, Jack, can you stay with us for one more segment? Sure. Not a problem. OK, I'm going to I'm going to hold you over because we got we're coming up on a break and I've got a couple questions for you. And, and we're going to see if the audience does as well. But uh, I, I appreciate you coming on. We're talking to legendary stunt coordinator Jack Gill, who worked on Furious 7 and a whole bunch of the Fast and Furious films and a lot of movies that you have heard of, but you might not have known. And uh, Jack, one, one thing I, I what, what, what's your favorite stunt? <laughs> that's, that's the tough one. That's the really tough one because so many movies have so many different elements that you really, really like. But when I was a stunt guy and I was doing stunts all the time, uh, you know, driving the Dukes of Hazard car in the General Lee was probably uh, the most fun job you could ever have because that show was number one and everybody loved it and everybody wanted to be Bo Duke. And I was the guy really driving the car around every single day and doing all those jumps. And then I went right into Knight Rider and drove the Knight Rider car. So between those two TV series, I had more fun than most guys are probably allowed to. Um, <laughs> the problem I have is that I, I've broken 22 bones and my neck once and my back twice. So it does oh, come boy. to problem. We'll get into more of that right after the break. We got legendary stunt coordinator Jack Gill. Stay tuned. Tim Donnelly show, and we are talking with a Hollywood legend, stunt coordinator Jack Gill, who has worked on an amazing number of films and, and iconic television shows like Dukes of Hazard, Knight Rider. By the way, uh, we had no idea it was you, Jack, but we, we watched from our dinner table for as long as we had a television, both of those shows, and uh, great I, that that had to be a lot of fun to do. And, I'm, you know, I know a lot of people want to get into the movies. They want to work in Hollywood. What would your advice be to them? Well, I mean, training is a lot of it. And, and you know, you can't just be good at one thing, especially in the stunt business, because you can't make a living at it. So it used to be a long time ago that, you know, when they did Westerns, if you were good with a horse, you could work in the business as a stuntman pretty easily. But times have changed. And now, Movies span just about everything you can think of, from even, you know, Roman gladiator movies to cars and motorcycles. And, you know, there's just everything you can think of. There's even ice skating movies. So you tend to have to be an all-around good athlete at just about everything. And the guys that really make it are the guys that continually practice and try to be better at everything they can think of. Like I was a skydiver and I used to teach gymnastics and I was a motocross racer and there was a million different things that kind of all work into you always use some part of it in you know, some part of the business, you just never know what's going to come up. Now for certain movies, you know, it's always new, but the thing that's good about it is you have a vast, you know, knowledge of people out there who are willing to help you. It's not such a stuck up business that nobody will help you, but you've got to be somebody that wants to work hard at it because there's a lot of competition out there. Yeah. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Hey, hey here's something that, that, is a little confusing. We watch the Academy Awards every year. They have all these categories. I mean, soundtrack, uh, you know, art, uh, set design, all these different categories uh, because movies encompass a lot more than just acting and, and writing and directing. But they don't have a category for, for stuntmen. And, and, I'm, and I'm wondering, I, I know you've been been pushing for that what what seems to be their their objection to it 
I mean, the the fast answer is they don't want us to be part of it. They they have the belief that they have everybody covered and that they haven't missed anybody and we just don't belong. And even though I've gotten petitions together with Steven Spielberg's name on it and, you know, Robert De Niro and Martin Scorsese and all these fabulous guys who have done wonderful things in the business and have enormous careers and I've plopped their signatures down in front of the Academy and they literally said, these guys don't make the decisions around here. Our board does. So, wow. Um, it's tough. It's really tough. And I think it's got to do with, you know, they, they are a hard, hard, you know, company to get into and they've, they've got staunch rules that they don't want to change. And I started this in 1991, trying to get an Academy Award for stunt coordinators. And they have fought me tooth and nail for 24 years. And it doesn't look like there's any light at the end of the tunnel. It looks like they're going to just continue to fight and throw up obstacles in front of us, even though, we try to explain to them that the Academy Award is for artistic and scientific um, outstanding work, and they don't seem to think that we are belong in either one of those categories. Uh, my, so it's I, all I got to do, all you got to do is watch that GoPro Furious Seven uh, link that we have up at uh, timdonnellyshow.com. I mean, holy moly! I was I was riveted. You know, it was so much nicer than having to read stuff. <laughs> I was just watching it. Yeah. And and I could see the science that you guys put together, and I don't even know how you were able to choreograph all those things because you got to get them all moving together, and you have all these moving parts. The movie wouldn't be the movie without that critical component, and I I wouldn't even limit it to just stunt men. I think the stunt coordinating team all together, you know, there's 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 the actor who is the stunt man, but there's also the stunt coordinator and and, and everything you guys do to make sure that that stunt is as safe as it can possibly be. Right. And, and all it really takes from the Academy is a vote. That's all it really is. And every year I have sent a registered letter to the Academy asking them to vote to, to create a category for the stunt coordinators of the Academy Awards. And every year they have either, either not voted on it, uh, you know, decided not to vote on it or have voted us down. And when I try and get an answer, there has been a, a multitude of so many different crazy reasons why one of them was we don't want to make the show any longer and i said fine we don't have to televise any part of our award we can do it the day before do it two hours before and then it came up well you know we're afraid that if we give you awards that people will go out there and try and kill themselves and i went why is what? this any different than the special effects award it's like it, you know special effects guys have the same ability but yet you give them an award and so i think they're just trying to throw up answers because they really just don't want us there yeah. Well, so are you going to give up the fight? No, I'm never going to give up the fight. And, I, and, and what I really don't want to do is, is the stunt people across the entire world have been trying to get me to agree to protesting the Academy Awards. And I have every year I've said no to it because I don't want to mess up anybody else's night. I don't want it to be about the protest because these people have one night to shine. And I don't want to be that group that came in and messed up their one night to shine. And so I've been against protesting, but we have protested in front of the Academy Awards one year. And it all boils down to this group of 37 board members who have to vote on whether they're going to allow us a category. And every year they say no to us. So I don't know what else we can do other than protest. But we're trying different ways. We're trying everything we can think of. And the Academy just keeps throwing up blockades. Well, you can do social media protests and get a whole lot of people to follow a hashtag and and tag all of the members if they if they have them I'm sure they do and they follow this stuff. Um, are you willing to take a a, a call from uh, from one of our listeners before you you go? Sure, no problem. Hey, welcome to the show. You're on with uh, myself and Jack Gill. Is that me? The uh, tone didn't change very much. That's you. Okay, great, uh, Jack. You're not going to remember the name probably, but this is Bill Blake. And uh, I'm an actor and an effects artist, and I used to work with uh, some of your contemporaries, Tom Morga, Ray Woodfork, uh, Wayne Bauer. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember all of them very well. Yeah, I was very, very heavily connected with Planet of the Apes and Logan's Run, and later doing effects, I did things like Batman and Robin and Batman Forever and things like that. And I've always been a little bit of, on the periphery of the stunt guys because they would come to me to build that special effects and things. So uh, I'm actually an honorary stuntman in John Hagner's uh, Stuntman's Hall of Fame. 
Oh, fantastic. Yeah, that's that's a great place to be, too, because John Hagner only picks the best of the best. And I, I got to say, the, the stunt people and stunt coordinators and the effects department work hand in hand because you do have each other's lives in your own hands with everything that you do that's dangerous. Yeah. Well, I'm up here in Sealand right now. I've lived up here for about 23 years, just uh, northeast of Los Angeles near Victorville. And uh, maybe you'd want to check out a uh, film festival they have up here every year. Believe it or not, in Hesperia, California, and you probably know the town, uh, they've got a film festival up here every year. I spoke at it last year. I have something else going on, and I'm not doing it this year. But on October 17th, they're having it again, and they got guys coming in from all over the world. And you and Morgan might want to go and check it out. And uh, if, if they say Hollywood comes to the high desert, and that's where I'm listening to uh, Tim's show from. He broadcasts out of uh, 960 AM up here, uh, Talk 960. So uh, I listen to Tim every day out of uh, the local station up here in Victorville. Oh, great. Yeah, I'll check them out. I'll definitely. And Morgan, I would love to come up there. It'd be a lot of fun. Okay. The film festival is called Desert Rocks Film and Music Event. Desert Rocks Fame, for short, which kind of ties in with the Hollywood thing. Desert well, Rocks Fame. Thank, Got it. Thanks yeah, for, go thanks to, for go letting go us know about that. that. All right. Thank you. And you guys take care. I listen to you every day. Hey, I appreciate that. Thanks for listening and thanks for calling. And uh, and Jack, look, you've been very patient and, and given us a great deal of your time. And I, I got to tell you, it's one of the most fun interviews I've done. I love interviewing your wife, but it's always about politics. And she kept pushing for me to interview you. <laughs> and I sent, I sent her a note. I said, man, your husband is awesome. Um, love your work. Love the enthusiasm. And, uh, you know, we'll check in with you when you're getting ready to do anything about the um, stunt category for for uh for stuntmen, I'm sorry, the uh, the Oscars category, because we'd, we'd love to be part of uh, making sure that they get honored. I think that I think that's a fantastic effort. Oh, fantastic. I appreciate it, because in March is when the Academy Awards happens, you know, at the end of March every year. So that would be the time I'd love to get hold of you and see if you can help out. Well, we, we, we will do it anyway. Thanks for coming on the show today. Jack Gill, legendary stunt coordinator and husband of actress Morgan Brittany. Thanks. Hey, you got it. 323-746-TALK. We will be right back with more of your calls. Coming up. Stay tuned. Whether you're an experienced shooter or just buying your first gun, Turner's Outdoorsman has everything you need, along with a knowledgeable and friendly staff to help you find that perfect gear for your next adventure. Turner's now has 18 locations across Southern California, including a Victorville location right on Bear Valley Road. Be sure to check out the new Archery Pro Shops in the Victorville, Chino Hills, and Pasadena locations. If you're not sure what you're looking for, you can browse and shop their selection at turners.com. Be sure to check out their weekly specials and sign up to get them delivered directly to your inbox. Turners is where I turn for all my firearms and ammo needs. Remember to tell them Tim Donnelly sent you and you'll get an additional discount. Hey, if you are just tuning in to the Tim Donnelly Show, where have you been? We've been having a lot of fun. Had a great conversation with a legendary stuntman, Jack Gill, out of the, well, obviously Hollywood, but uh, I'm not going to say where he lives. Um, gonna gonna go back to politics. Sorry, don't, don't, I'm warning. I'm warning you in case you're driving. But look, there's some good news. Not for Jeb Bush, but Jeb Bush in a poll has fallen to 4%. So this is a Pew poll. The latest Pew poll shows Jeb Bush has fallen to 4% in the Republican field. Donald Trump, once again, Trump's all, leads the field with 25%. Ben Carson at 16%. And then you've got 
the usual suspects. Rubio is holding his own at eight, along with Fiorina. Cruz is still at six percent. I, I keep wondering when he's going to break out. He, he he certainly has a lot a lot of the bona fides. He he's got the policy stuff. He's got the he's got the the courage. We know that he'll stand and and fight in the in the in the Senate and stand up for the people and filibuster and everything else, but. You know what my concern for Ted Cruz is? is very simple. It's 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 this it's the stagecraft. There's a certain way you've got to communicate with the American people, and I don't think he's quite mastered that yet. And I believe that's fixable to a certain extent. So uh, there's certainly hope for him. But I'm really glad to see Jeb Bush fall all the way back that far because it shows this is a different time. The outsiders are in. The insiders are out and people are mad as hell and they're and they're not going to take it anymore. People want. They want a serious change. And. Man, it, it's a tough time to be to be establishment. You know, you, you see Jeb struggling. You see Hillary struggling because they're basically two sides of the same coin. They, they are the establishment candidate in each camp. But the establishment is really one and the same. There's a political class, a power class, that includes the 1% of the one percenters. It includes the vast majority, 80, 90% of those in high elected office. And once you get behind closed doors, they're pretty much all the same. Yeah, they might have a slightly different viewpoint on a few issues and, and slightly different ideologies. But in the end, it is all about power and exercising that power over others and believing that they are uniquely qualified to make our decisions for us. Not to listen to us and rule at our consent, but literally to make our decisions for us. That's why you see such a disconnect between the populace who, let's just take an issue, illegal immigration. The populace wants illegal immigration stopped. They don't like paying for it. They don't like the they don't like seeing people become victims of crimes. They don't like see to, to see people being murdered by those who are in the country illegally because that's a preventable crime. They don't like to see the the vast drain on our natural and financial resources, our fiscal resources, because then that puts everyone else at risk who is a citizen, who is a legal lawful resident. But if you take the actual, if you take the populist view, and note I use the word popul- populous and then populist. No, we're not going to get into etymology. But for those of you thinking about voting for Bill Clinton, <laughs> oh, did I say Bill Clinton? <laughs> Uh, and you got I, Bill. You got Bill on your mind because he was nice enough to sit in today as the program monitor. I do not recall, <laughs> Mr. President. Uh, may I ask you, since you're you're here in studio at the Tim Donnelly Show, uh, why isn't your wife moving ahead in the polls? Uh, look here, Sean. You know, I just want to be really clear. I am doing everything I can behind the scenes to get that woman out of my house. I want her in the people's house. I, if she would just go, <laughs> then I could party. I could have fun. Yes, heck, sir. heck, I'd even have you over for a beer. You could, you know, pull, that, I, you could pull that saxophone out, out of the closet. Yeah, I, I could pull a lot more out of the closet than that, let me tell you. But I know this is a G-rated <laughs> show. But but look, let's get serious here. With with When Donald Trump comes out and takes a populist view of an issue, what that means is he stands up for the people. It's that simple. So he stands with 80% of the people who are like, who say, do something about illegal immigration. Don't sit around and talk about it. Have a plan. Have some courage. Take some heat for us. Well, Donald Trump certainly took heat. And it was the heat that he took. It was the criticism. It was the attacks. It was the, the, the absolute assault on his character, on his business, on everything that brought him to the, to, to the people. And 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 the and the people love someone who will stand up and fight for them. And and the more that Donald Trump is attacked and vilified by the establishment and the media 
and 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 all those who think they're part of the elite who are so much better than the rest of us. They will defend Donald Trump to the nth degree. And that's the difference between a Jeb Bush and a Donald Trump. And I believe that if this continues, if this trend continues, we're going to see a populist presidential candidate for the first time in a long time. Ronald Reagan was a populist. Doesn't mean that he agrees with a populist on every single solitary issue. Doesn't mean he will not stand up and disagree with the public when he believes that a principle or, or a serious issue is at stake. Certainly not. But see, it shows you have respect for the people because A, you listen to them, and then B, you go to them and you present your case. And, and, and I think Donald Trump has the potential to be that kind of candidate, and there couldn't be a better climate. <laughs> uh, maybe there's a better word than climate. It's really a tide. There's a tide running, and it's really hard to fight a tide. You ever been out there and you, and you get start to get swept away, and, and you don't know how to get back to shore because the tide is moving you, and you have no power over it? There is a tide that is moving in the 2016 presidential election, and it is moving against the insiders, against the D.C. crowd, against the politicians, and it is moving in favor of the people. And it is that tide that that threatens to sweep Jeb Bush and his establishment campaign and all of that money out to sea. And wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? Wouldn't it be nice to actually be able to pick from a candidate who is, is willing to stand with the American people and stand up against the establishment, the elitist, and, hey, uh, by the way, the Republicans might just find out that is a winning strategy. Don't look now. But if this trend continues, the GOP might have a future. 323-746-TALK. We'll take your calls when we get back. Hey, if you like shooting as much as I do, you've probably been to a lot of ranges. Unless you visited Burrow Canyon Shooting Park, you've never seen anything like it. On the way there, you'll find yourself taking pictures as you traverse the majestic Azusa Canyon and wind your way up into the Angeles National Forest. With over 600 acres, including 19 private ranges, there's something for everyone. There's rifle and pistol ranges for beginners, right up to advanced shooters. And there's plenty of spaces to shoot sporting clay. You can make a family day of it, or you can bring a group for team building exercises. Bring a picnic lunch. On the weekends, they provide lunch. And don't worry, they always have ammo in case you forget yours or run out. One thing I can guarantee is that once you visited my friends at Burrow Canyon Shooting Park, you'll be hooked and you'll keep coming back. BurrowCanyon.com is their website or call them at 626-910-1344. 626-910-1344. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It has been quite the week. We are here, finally, free for all Friday. We are in the final half hour heading home for the weekend. Yeah, it's finally here. And, of course, it has been a rough week in some parts of the country. We, we opened up today's show talking about the Oregon killer. Uh, New York Post headline is Oregon gunmen singled out Christians during rampage. And, of course, he's he's not a gunman. He's a killer. He's a murderer. 
Uh, but the fact that he did single out Christians is really, really chilling. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we have heard Christians demonized in this country by the left, by the media, by all kinds of people. It's just ripe and rampant throughout the culture. And this guy was a Nazi lover. He had lots of Nazi memorabilia. He had a fascination with the terror tactics of the Irish Republican Army. And it's never really fully explained. He, he left some very disturbing letters and, and messages. But it's, it's, it's deeply disturbing to me that he had such a hatred for Christians. And there were students there who said that the, the students were scrambling like ants trying to get away from him. It was, it was chaos. And the gunman, the, no, I'm not going to use that term, the killer singled out Christians telling them they would see God in one second during the rampage at the Umpqua Community College Thursday that left at least 10 people dead and several more wounded. He started asking people one by one what their religion was. Are you a Christian? He would ask them. And if you're a Christian, stand up. And they would stand up. And he said, good, because you're a Christian, you're going to see God in just about one second. And then he shot and killed them, shot him right through the head. It's according to Stacy Boland, whose daughter was wounded at the Umpqua College in Roseburg, Oregon. A Twitter user said her grandmother was at the scene of the carnage, tweeted that if victims were Christians, they were shot in the head. If they said no or didn't answer, they were shot in the leg. So if you denied Christ, you lived. Jeez, really makes you, uh, really makes you wonder what, what would you do? If you had a chance to just stay quiet, not mention your faith, you get to live. What would you do? I think that's a heavy question because most of the time we're never confronted with anything like that. Do you really truly believe in, in, in what you believe in? Do you believe Jesus is the son of God? Are you an, a, a Christian? And if you are a Christian, are you going to deny Christ in order to live? Or are you going to acknowledge Christ and live on this earth one more second only? Die. But of course, the scripture says when you die to self, you, you gain true life. Because you have life in Christ. So I guess really the question there was what you truly believe. Do you believe what you believe? Are you a true believer in your faith? That's a, that's a, a, a very heavy test. And it is one that I know I wouldn't want to be put in that situation, but uh, I'm not going to be flippant and say, well, this is what I would have done because you don't really know until that moment is there, but it makes you think. It makes you uncomfortable. And uh, if you have a thought about that, you're welcome to call in 323-746-TALK. The, the killer was 26 years old. He posted online the day before that he was going to do this. Now, he didn't give the location, but he, he definitely gave a, a decent amount of information. I'm sure if all those government agents that are spying on us through the NSA and everything, if they just picked up some, some clues, they could have figured out what college campuses he's close to. He said the Northwest. I mean, but, but the NSA could literally nail down to his house or his phone or whatever. They're doing that right now to... To, to you and I, why can't they do that to an ISIS uh, terrorist? Why can't they do that to a would-be mass murderer who is planning to go to a gun-free zone? Just makes you wonder. And then, and then you have the, you have the just completely idiotic policies. And these are, these are policies of the left. These, th th this is how the left reasons that 
those who oppose armed guards or arming teachers on campuses cite idiocies like changing the culture or making children uncomfortable. Randy Weingarten, the head of the National Education Association, has written, schools must be safe sanctuaries, not armed fortresses. Anyone who would suggest otherwise doesn't understand that our public schools must first and foremost be places where teachers can safely educate and nurture our students. <laughs> That's just asinine. The only way to keep students safe is provide security, not hope that the gunman as might abide by the gun-free school zone signs. He might see the sign and go, wow, it says strict penalties for bringing a weapon on campus. Oh, I shouldn't do that. In Israel, in order to prevent terrorist attacks, armed guards are posted in schools routinely. You know, th those guys are carrying heavy-duty weaponry. They're not carrying small time. There, there's no small caliber going around there. It's, it, it's heavy-duty stuff. It's, it's the real deal. I'm going to go to the phones and get your thoughts. Hey, welcome to the show. Hello, uh, this you is are Stephen. Live. Are you hearing me okay? Hi, Stephen. How are you? I'm doing well, Tim. Thank you for uh, taking my call. I was uh, listening as to what you were saying, and I, I agree. I, it's, uh, it's difficult to pre-plan how you would respond to being in that scenario with a, a barrel aiming right at you. I'm thinking maybe we have a chance to pre-plan uh, in some sense based on the scriptures. And I kind of, you, you got me thinking, what should I do if I find myself in that situation? And I'm thinking if you're going to die anyway with that barrel aiming at you as a Christian, you might as well go telling him the gospel. Yeah, that, that that's, okay? that's one way you, yeah, no, that's one way you could approach it. And, you know, I, I think all of us, Stephen, all of us feel that sense that perhaps we wouldn't actually, you, you know how, how uh, Peter said, hey, I will never deny you, Lord, and then denied him three yeah. times before the crow uh, cried, and or the rooster, I'm sorry. Um, and, and I think all of us feel in our heart that we would never deny, but then our courage betrays us or fails. Because we're human. And, and, and you have every right to be absolutely terrified in that situation. But you know what? I think you've got a great suggestion. Because nothing else, there, there, other than a firearm to, to literally kill him, if you have no weapon, and there's nothing more powerful. And, and, and I'm not making a comparison between a weapon and the Word of God. Let me be clear. The words of God are more powerful than any force yeah. on earth that could touch his heart and change him. And people have done that with with uh, would be yeah, killers, I, and and it's worked. So I, I I think you got a good suggestion there. What now? Now let me yeah, ask you. I mean, I, have you? Sure. Oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was going to agree that you know it's during the commission of a crime, and that's probably the best time. You know, Jesus spent his time with criminals and prostitutes and thieves, and um, so and and when somebody puts a gun to your to you and, and and it says, "Are you a Christian?" You know, why are we cowering to that as if he has some authority? He has zero authority to demand answers from us. So let's take control of it. Let's not let him be in control of it, and let's throw a question. Let's answer his question with a question. All like right. Jesus now that's did. what that's what I want to know. What question would you ask? I would say, "Don't you believe?" Have you, I would say, have you ever seen a painting without a painter? Have you ever seen a building that did not have a builder? You know, you're created in the image of God. I would just blast him with questions. Hmm. And, I don't know. And maybe I, not I even think, wait around. I don't think I would take that tack with this guy. He was just pretty much putting bullets through people's heads as soon as he found out they were Christians. I think you have about a second yeah. to say something. I, yeah. I, I've been, I, I did this when I was confronted with a bully in grade school. And this bully was, you know how they used to have the urinals that would be all the way up, the big tall ones, the old fashioned ones from Florida, you know, like yes. chest high. And this kid was standing on top of it. And there was only one and I needed, you know, to use the bathroom. And 
he was a mean kid and and he was threatening to to harm me and and I just looked up at him I said Jesus loves you and that kid broke down he got down and he literally broke down into tears and I hadn't done anything it was the power of God through those words but I yeah. think that a message like that you might be able to get that message out and that might transform his heart or something you know you you might have a slightly different version of it but but I but I think that you, you got a good idea Stephen we got to take a break here but thanks thanks for your call okay Hey, 323-746-TALK if you want to get in on the final Tim Donnelly show before the weekend. We'll be right back. experienced shooter or just buying your first gun, Turner's Outdoorsman has everything you need, along with a knowledgeable and friendly staff to help you find that perfect gear for your next adventure. Turner's now has 18 locations across Southern California, including a Victorville location right on Bear Valley Road. Be sure to check out the new Archery Pro Shops in the Victorville, Chino Hills, and Pasadena locations. If you're not sure what you're looking for, you can browse and shop their selection at turners.com. Be sure to check out their weekly specials and sign up to get them delivered directly to your inbox. Turners is where I turn for all my firearms and ammo needs. Remember to tell them Tim Donnelly sent you and you'll get an additional discount. It is a free-for-all Friday, and we are headed into the weekend. Thank God it's Friday. I mean, it, it certainly has been a tough week across this country. We've been talking about the Oregon shooting, the mass murder committed by a 26-year-old man who basically hated everybody. I, I think he even hated himself. He hated God. He hated Christians. He hated uh, anybody who wasn't white, he was a white supremacist uh, follower of Hitler, loved his Nazi memorabilia, studied the terrorist tactics of the IRA, and made a point to ask people their religion, and if they said they were Christians, they were shot in the head. I know, this is heavy stuff going into the weekend, but it, it happened. And the news media is is going to downplay a lot of it, even though they, they are actually covering this aspect. And, and, of course, you have the gun control advocates crawling out of the woodwork saying we need more gun control. I, I, hate, I hate to break the news to you guys, but your gun control hasn't worked. You know, as I was starting to say in Israel, armed guards, and, the, and these guys are carrying, like, M16s, fully automatic, by the way, posted in the schools routinely. And this says prevented terrorist attacks. And there's just, there's just a point at which we need to, we, we need to stop people like President Barack Obama in his tracks. I, I wish a reporter had just raised his hand and said, hey, wait a minute, I, I got to ask you. They legally procured their guns in almost every one of these mass shootings. So your background checks didn't work. All your controls didn't work. You, you, you need to admit you cannot prevent a deeply disturbed person who has allowed evil to overtake his soul. You can't stop that. Maybe his parents could stop it. Maybe someone else could stop it. But you, with new laws, you got no chance. Not going to happen. And, but see, no one ever asked that question. They don't ask that question because 
I think a lot of the reporters know that the agenda has nothing to do with stopping the next shooting. It has everything to do with a justification to disarm America. Same as they did in the UK, same as they did in Australia. You know, it reminds me, yes, I'm going to say something about SB277. It reminds me of the SB277 fight. You get an outbreak at Disneyland. It's brought in by an illegal alien or a legal tourist who came into the country from outside of the country. So do you clamp down on illegal aliens? Do you clamp down on the border and the airports? Do you require a, a full vaccination schedule for every visitor to the U.S.? No. You find somebody else, make them the scapegoat. In this case, the people who have chosen to either not vaccinate or selectively vaccinate their kids and go blame them. Pass a law. Take away their freedom. In this case, this is a much more sinister scenario because they know that more people are going to die in these gun-free school zones. They will not ever budge on allowing teachers, administrators, janitors, whomever, our school personnel and students to CCW carry on campus. They have been pushing and pushing and pushing to make these schools gun-free school zones. And it, it has been very effective at creating targets for the deranged, for the evil. Virginia Tech, 33 dead. I got a simple solution. It's not a government solution. If you got a kid going to school, make sure they get their CCW before they leave. I, I, I believe they can get them when they're 18. I, 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 may need, I, may, I may need to be corrected on that, but I'm fairly certain. Uh, maybe it's 21. But maybe, maybe I'm off on that. But, but whatever, the earliest age they can get them and get them some training and, and, and instruct them in civil disobedience. Do not go to school unarmed. That would be my advice. Don't wait for the government to fix this. They can't. Anyway, sadly, we are out of time. I don't do this show alone. I want to thank everyone who helps with it. And I want to thank you for being there every day, three to six. God bless you and Godspeed. Tim Donnelly Show, out. Get the rocket train.